Hello, my name is Talila Lutkin and I'm a Utility Performance Editor at Global Water Intelligence. Back in March, I travelled to New York to the UN Water Conference. And for me and my colleagues at GWI, the most exciting thing to come out of the Water Conference was this little booklet. It was published by the Global Commission on the Economics of Water and it's their call to action. It presents seven action points that all stakeholders involved in water, which is pretty much the whole planet, need to be working towards in order to ensure that we have enough water for all and that we're managing that water sustainably. The full report will come out in a year and a half, but we at GWI consider this to be a game-changing approach to solving the water crisis in terms of governments, policy, finance, innovation. Um, and this is why we wanted to give you some insights into this report to frame the discussion around water finance at the 2023 World Water Week. The principles in this call to action um, and those that are framing the upcoming report are grounded in scientific research and a driving innovation in finance in the water sector. So for this, I spoke to three of the co-chairs of the Global Commission of the Economics of Water, as well as one of the commissioners, who each bring their perspective um, to this collaborative effort by the commission. Um, and I hope you find it insightful. This is one of the, let's say, fundamental scientific entry points for the economics of water work, which is that we have so much evidence today that uh, we are, as as humanity, uh, posing so large pressures on the Earth system as a whole that we are changing the functioning of the of the global hydrological cycle. So for the first time, we have to recognize that not only which we have known for a very long time, that, that we're changing the water supply and, and, and uh, having rising water demands and uh, water quality challenges and, and how water flows in, in river basins and watersheds. But now also for the first time, we have to recognize that we're changing the very input, namely precipitation levels through climate change, but also through land use change. So today we are cannot even rely on rainy seasons or, or uh, you know, influxes of fresh water at any scale, at any time time step. We also see more and more evidence that water that we often perceive as a local issue is in fact um, much more regional and much more interdependent across different geographical scales because um, it's not as simple as we've often portrayed it that the, the precipitation of the land originates from evaporation from the oceans, but that in the order of 40, in some places up to 50% of precipitation levels comes from green water flows, meaning evapotranspiration flows from ecosystems, from land areas. And this is um, fundamental because it means that upwind countries with the large forest systems often generate and export water supplying and securing precipitation levels for downwind countries. So you have atmospheric rivers that are flowing in the atmosphere, just like we have rivers on land, which goes from upstream to downstream, but in this case is upwind to downwind and, and securing uh, or at least um, influencing water supply across big big regions and uh, this science uh, these two these two kind of conclusions from the science that one we are for the first time jeopardizing or threatening the very supply of, of precipitation where we're just shifting the global biological cycle and number two that we have these atmospheric rivers where what happens upwind on land in, in influences the availability of water downstream take these together and you, we draw the conclusion that we have to uh, define and understand and manage and value water as a global common good, meaning that we can no longer think of, of water being something that is, uh, you know, provided by the environment beyond any influence by humans, some gift from God, which then uh, has variability and challenges, but just natural variabilities. And then that the our, our, our human challenge only being allocation of those resources and ensuring efficient water use and water quality. 
we're arguing that that is not enough. The, the, the new economics of water must also be stewards of the very source, ensuring the stability of the whole planet, ensuring the stability of the biological cycle, and recognizing these atmospheric rivers. And the implications of this is, is very dramatic because you have, just to give you a few examples, that um, a country like Russia, for example, is, is a massive uh, importer of precipitation. So, so depending on, on green water flows from forest systems from neighboring countries to the West. So countries like Ukraine and Kazakhstan and the Baltic states and the, and the Nordic states. Uh, so, so you have a, a downwind country, Russia, depending on, on management of ecosystems upwind. And then you have countries like Brazil that is hosting a major, major uh, precipitation provider and supplying that down, downwind um, to countries in, in the southern parts of, of South America. So a big exporter of fresh water. And, and this is um, uh, not only uh, a, you know, a major issue in terms of geopolitics, but it's also an issue of, of how you value freshwater as a as a capital asset uh, in terms of the stability of economies because we know that uh, if if you uh, push water beyond thresholds in terms of extremes i mean both flooding and droughts you impact on on food on energy on basic livelihoods which then can translate into impacts on on economy but also in social instabilities so that is basically the, the um, let's say, the, the, the scientific journey from, from the basic science on global hydrology, atmospheric rivers and earth system pressures, all the way to uh, concluding water as a global commons and how that then impacts on, uh, on valuation of, of fresh water. And I also uh, had this term that I think that uh, that you have used this, this term of planetary boundaries and that you have said that we are kind of outside of the safe zone uh, when it comes to fresh water um, in terms of those planetary boundaries and sort of, you know, how is that linked to these atmospheric rivers and what does that actually mean in practice that we're kind of outside of the safe zone and why, why is that dangerous? The reason why we are at this juncture where we're now at risk of, of changing the inflow of fresh water so we are um you know through through climate change powering up the whole hydrological cycle by adding even more vapor to the atmosphere because the warmer the temperature on earth the more moisture can be held in the atmosphere and more evaporation occurs from from the ocean but also when we transgress the planetary boundaries on biodiversity on land system change in particular, we change the green water flows, the green water being, you know, the part of the hydrological cycle where rainfall infiltrates in, in the ground and a significant portion, actually 70% of the fresh water flows back into the atmosphere as, as transpiration was taken up by roots and evaporation from, from, from soil and land surfaces. Now, um, this occurs because we're transgressing planetary boundaries. So the planetary boundaries are defined to provide us with a safe operating space that keeps the Earth system in a, in a stable state in terms of all the life support systems. So basically, it's about setting scientifically defined boundaries that can keep the planet as close as possible to, to the Holocene state that we've had, you know, for 12,000 years of civilizational development before we started this exponential rise of pressures on the planet through unsustainable, uh, you know, exploitation, both of fresh water, but also of all the other boundaries. So the boundaries are set to keep the hydrological cycle within a safe space. And we've identified nine large systems and processes that together regulates the state of the planet and climate being one, the global hydrological cycle being a second, so the bloodstream of the whole Earth system. But then we also have what I call the biosphere boundaries, which is land system change, biodiversity, the interference with the two big nutrient cycles, nitrogen and phosphorus, 
and um, and then these together, so water, land, biodiversity, nutrients forming the biosphere boundaries. And then, of course, you have chemical loading, which influences water quality, stratospheric ozone depletion, the stratospheric protective stratospheric ozone layer, aerosol loading, so air pollutants, which also affects freshwater supply because when you dim the lower atmosphere too much with smog and, and uh, particles like black carbon and sulfates causing uh, you know, reflection of incoming solar radiation, it changes the energy balance and just and impacts also on monsoon systems, mm -hmm. so also impacting our freshwater supply. And finally, ocean stability. So the boundaries are set to keep the logical cycle stable. And now we are outside of the safe space, not only on the water boundaries, but also on the biosphere and climate boundary, which all of it, all of these together, impact back on the logical cycle so you 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 deforest too much and change too much of of uh, terrestrial ecosystems it impacts on green water flows you transgress the climate boundary you change the energy balance on planet earth you change the aerosol boundary you get more pollutants you impact on the monsoon but moreover we today must um, conclude based on the latest science that we are transgressing the you know, not only the boundaries that impact on the supply of fresh water, so all the other boundaries, the, the, the biosphere and the climate and the air, air pollution boundaries, but we're also transgressing the water boundaries themselves. What, what this tells us in conclusion is that we're both losing the resilience of the Earth system's capacity to keep the hydrological cycle stable, and moreover, we are mismanaging the cycle and pushing the boundaries outside of their safe levels. So that is also um, very strong scientific arguments why we need to very rapidly come back within a safe space to, to keep the hydrological cycle or the water balances across river basins on Earth within, within a manageable range. And how much of this is due to uh, I mean, obviously, these are both kind of um, human induced, but how much is due to climate change and how much is due to um, the other things that you mentioned? So um, uh, things like uh, land use, deforestation, agricultural choices. Well, what are the which one of those impacts the water cycle more or is it both or what, where, where, do, where does the work need to be? Oh, that's a really good question. And um, it doesn't have a straight answer because it it varies depending on what location you are at. I mean, if you if you take, um, let's say, uh, an aggregate view on the planet as a whole, I would argue that climate change is the is the dominant driver of change of uh, of causing extremes in terms or, or extreme variability in terms of freshwater supply. So droughts, floods, heat waves, which also evaporates water and and thereby induces more water scarcity this is let's say if you look at it unified across the entire planet i think climate change is the dominant force however when you look at specific areas like for example in the rainforest regions then it's it's clear that uh, land use change is is an even more uh, important driver right now i mean so deforestation changing drying out the systems and reducing green water flows and thereby convective rainfall. So if you if you lose the broad canopy cover in, in moist, very, very humid rainforest systems, they get they get opened up, they get dried out through, uh, you know, air flowing through, it reduces the whole cycling of vapor and thereby reduces uh, precipitation levels and this moisture recycling is is due to land use change um, and of course reinforced by climate change but there you have a combination of, of both and then finally you have what you could argue being one of the biggest concerns right now from a local perspective which is the glacial melt uh, when mountain glaciers uh, which are you know mountain fountains of freshwater supply and of course the the, the big Ground zero here is the Tibetan highlands with, uh, you know, feeding seven big rivers. I mean, massive rivers like the Ganges and the Mekong 
uh, which which then supplies uh, fresh water for for billions of people across uh, South and Southeast Asia. So you cannot really single out climate change or land use changes. It's often combinations, and it differs from location to location. And so all these changes that are happening, all this urgency that, that that we have to fix the problem, how does that, what does that mean for the way that we are going to value water? And, you know, what are the investments that are needed sort of now and, and where are the priorities for for making those changes? Mm. Yeah, so that's the big uh, question, how how to economically value water. And and the starting point is, is very uh, dire because we are mismanaging, not only are we mismanaging water, both in terms of quality and quantity, we're not even able to supply fresh water for, you know, the three billion people across the world that are lacking access to um, to adequate, healthy fresh water levels just for domestic water use. And we have an even larger challenge when it comes to securing fresh water for for food in the future. So, so this is um, uh, a strong proof that we're undervaluing water. We are we're simply taking water for for granted as, as, as a free uh, public good when when in fact it is a very precious finite resource that we are at risk of um, that that is at risk of being um, one of if not the factor that um, hinders us from delivering on the sustainable development goals of uh, eradicating poverty and hunger and and certainly will be a very determining factor when it comes to whether or not we'll be able to deliver on the climate and biodiversity frameworks because fresh water is behind all carbon and fresh water is behind all life so we're undervaluing water and and we're working very hard in the economics of water commission to think through what are the economic policies that would that we would recommend to be put in place to to put an economic value on water when it comes to investments and and this is very difficult uh, it has been tried for decades i mean there's been uh, since the, um, the the dublin conference 1992 and and the world water forum work in in the netherlands in the millennium on putting a price on water and and valuing water as an economic good the recognition that 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 is very complicated because you you stumble into major major institutional challenges but also equity challenges um it's not as simple as just putting a dollar sign on water and and you've solved the problems because water is, is a fundamental human right it's even recognized in the un charter as a, as a fundamental human right so um i think that the the path forward is, is not to put a monetary value on water. Of course, there, there is a monetary value on water when it comes to treated water in urban areas for drinking water supply, for example. I mean, we can have much, much better efficiencies through conventional economics for domestic water in, in cities, no doubt. But it's much more difficult to, to put a monetary value or put water in economics for the big, big volumes of water, which is for food for ecosystems and for uh, societal stability. And, and for that, I mean, just to a little tangent to remind you that, remind us that, you know, for domestic use, we need, you know, something like 50 to 100 liters of fresh water per person per day. But we need something like 3000 liters per person per day for food. So, so the big fresh water, uh, you know, supply required for human well-being is for food 95 percent domestic use industrial use for health are very important fundamental for water quality but they're not quantity challenges we will never run out of water for drinking water ever but we may be running out of water for food and for ecosystems for energy and biomass that's the big consumer so how to put an economic value to that? And, and that's where we are today working that there's a very big difference between monetary value and economic value. You could, you can, um, um, you know, put, put a value, economic value on water as a capital asset without necessarily putting a monetary value on it by quantifying water as a currency behind different 
services that society needs to or wants to provide for its citizens. So, for example, if you have a a country or region that wants to secure healthy diets for all its citizens, you can quantify how much fresh water is required to deliver that, whether it comes locally or from virtual water from trade. And if you put if you induce or, or introduce economic policies that really invest in that, then of course the investments are the monetary costs to secure the um, drip irrigation systems, the dams, uh, water harvesting system, wh wh whatever management systems you put in place. But but the monetary value is not on per cubic meter water; it's rather on the infrastructure you put in place to secure that service, which is your per capita uh, minimum amount of fresh water for human well-being. So so this is this is ongoing work and uh, we're hoping to make some 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 major uh, advancements here. But I come back to, to the where I started. The the new concept is water as a global commons that um, um, if you are Brazil and you are hosting a significant part of the Amazon basin, you're hosting and being steward of a global commons. And that commons is an export, is a producer of rainfall, and it's an exporter of fresh water. So if you're hosting a global commons, which is a service to humanity, and particularly a service to your downwind neighbor countries, you should be in a position to um, be compensated for that economically compensated for that. And uh, I think that is also uh, an additional economic policy uh, dimension of, uh, of the economics of water. There needs to be a lot more money and a lot more investment in water and about solving water challenges across the world. Um, and so in your opinion, uh, how do we get that money and invest investment flowing to the right places and how do trade agreements come into that and the virtual water that you just mentioned? Um, to get money flowing for water, I think we need to lay out the logic for increased investments in water infrastructure and better water management. Um, simply put, Access to water stands as a prerequisite to achieve most, if not all, of the SDGs. Uh, and if we want to ensure a sustainable future, we must invest in water. Uh, so we need to lay out that framework and, and, and uh, give the groundings and the context for that. The initial findings of the Global Commission uh, on the Economics of Water and I, 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 the data that underlies our March 2023 report, Turning the Tide, estimates that we must multiply existing investments in water by a factor of three to ensure universal access to safely manage water and sanitation and enable its more sustainable use in major sectors. Um, I'd like to, to just note that chronic underinvestment in water has emerged as a worldwide problem, including in many high income countries where the water infrastructure is aging, increasingly dysfunctional. And in low and middle in income countries where the investment is, the infrastructure is non-existent in many cases uh, or, or very rudimentary, we're estimating 200 to about $400 billion per year of additional investments in low and low middle income countries will be needed to achieve universal access to water and sanitation by, by 2030. And so you sort of uh, mentioned this framework uh, that there's a need to sort of reshape, uh, I think, global governance. And that's something that you mentioned in the report. Um, mm -hmm. And so from your perspective, um, you know, how does that reshaping need to happen and, and what are the tools and what would that new framework uh, look like? So reshaping global governance, we believe, really needs urgent attention. And uh, as our March 2023 findings uh, noted, the existing global governance architecture for water is not really fit for purpose. It's fragmented, it's siloed, it's incomplete, and uh, lacks solid underpinnings with data underpinnings are, are, not, are not there or are, there's a lot of short, shortcomings. There are also shortcomings that result in inconsistent incentives to efficient water use. 
um, the unnecessary uncertainties that make it harder to attract investment capital and duplication of efforts to address the various dimensions of our shared water crisis, as well as gaps in the global response. And uh, WTO and international trade policies can play a role in this effort to, to help reshape global governance of water because um, I mentioned earlier the importance of virt virtual water trade in agriculture and other products. But one important thing to know is that one in five calories consumed across the world comes from uh, traded goods. And, uh, you know, so so that's a lot of uh, virtual water in, in embedded, at least in, in agriculture and other goods. And so trade could promote sustainable water use by highlighting unsustainable and wasteful water subsidies, incorporating water efficiency standards in trade and ensuring that trade policies do not worsen water scarcity in water stress regions. We, we can also highlight some of the um, uh, trade distorting and environmentally unsustainable subsidies in agriculture, which we believe will need to be repurposed. So doing all of that helps us to shape how we approach the governance uh, 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 of the water sector uh, going forward. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I have a few questions about uh, subsidies um, a little bit later on, but uh, I also mm -hmm. wanted to um, ask about the importance of underpricing water, because that's something that's one of the uh, action points that comes up in the report is this question of not underpricing water. And so uh, why is that important and how do you go about not underpricing water? Well, pricing water to reflect its value serves to, to provide an incentive for water use efficiency and to highlight the importance of water conservation in all settings, households, industrial settings, agricultural settings. And uh, putting a price on water also makes funding water projects easier. So it provides a revenue stream that can attract uh, broader pools of capital. Um, a pricing mechanism creates just this sort of incentive uh, and helps to free up water resources for those who are currently underserved. And this is a very important point that I want to make. I'm not just talking about the importance of pricing water because I'm an economist by training and people will think, you know, yes, of course you would say that. I strongly believe and we believe in the commission that pricing water advances not just efficiency, but also equity goals. Not properly pricing water leads to inefficient use and misallocation. And that means that those who are who, who, who don't, uh, uh, the poorer people who don't have access are worse off. But if you price water and, and, and then you can actually be more efficiently used, that will release additional water. Uh, for, for those who are at the poor end to be able to use. So this is a big point that that is very important to us. People often think that the efficiency and equity goals are, are um, that there's a trade-off be, be, between them. But in the case of water, and at this point in time, we believe that there's no trade-off, but that you actually need that efficiency in order to ensure equity, to ensure water goes to poor people. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, because it sounds a little bit counterintuitive initially when you say, you know, we need to increase the price of water. That means, oh, well, how do we square that with affordability? But from your perspective, it's all about reallocating the water to the most vulnerable. Yes. And uh, of course, um, to assure the affordability of the resource, we recognize that, um, you know, this water is a critical input in agriculture, industry, and at the same time is a basic human right. So what we need to do is to strike a balance between efficient water allocation for production and ensuring access to water as a basic right, particularly for poor and disadvantaged uh, communities. What does this mean? It means in reality that we must also accompany proper water pricing with appropriate policies that ensure affordability of water uh, and access to the poor and vulnerable. So we want to release enough water so they can actually have access. At the same time, we want to make sure we put in place uh, sub, uh, 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 mechanisms, social policies that enable them to have access. And if this means support for poorer people, uh, you know, then this, this, so these are the kinds of policies we need to, to look at. 
the report has quite a um, uh, striking uh, message, which is to phase out agricultural subsidies. Um, and so, first of all, how would we do that? Um, and is it really about phasing out all agricultural subsidies, or is it about channeling those subsidies in a way that's more uh, that encourages more water efficient agriculture? First of all, let's make clear that what we are talking about is trade distorting and environmentally damaging agricultural subsidies. And it's not that all subsidies are bad. There can actually be subsidies to research for agricultural research uh, and, and applications that are good. And, and if we want to get, we're in the era of climate change. If we want to get more drought resistant, more water tolerant crops, we have to put money in research and we have to subsidize research. This is also subsidies, but those can be good subsidies. You want to change habits, sometimes they're good subsidies. What we are talking about is that there are a lot of sub subsidies, could be up to $600 billion of agricultural subsidies that are trade distorting and environmentally damaging. Those are the ones we are saying we should repurpose. There are also water subsidies, you know, and that could be up to 200 to 300 billion that are also distortive. So those kinds of subsidies, not to talk of fossil fuel subsidies, we need to repurpose them. So we are not saying you just cut them off. We are saying, look, if we want more investment in water infrastructure, particularly for poor people and poor areas, where do we get the money? These subsidies could make a big dent in those kinds of, of investments. So that's the repurposing. If we want climate uh, justice, we want water justice, we, we can channel those monies to those kinds of activities, which will probably benefit the poor, poor people better. So one the final point that I kind of wanted to bring up here was uh, this question of bringing the private sector into this, right? So and I think that in the report, um, you talk about just water partnerships, and that's the way that um, the private sector can become part of this. And while still, um, you know, being being just and uh, having those goals of like he was mentioning earlier, of equity, equity, etc. So I just want to tell you if you could tell me a little bit more about these just water partnerships, what they are, um, how they work, what do they actually entail, and, and what's the importance of the private sector as well in, in this? Well, water is not just a victim, but also a driver of the climate uh, crisis. And we are very clear that we cannot tackle climate change without fixing our water challenges. That means we have to coordinate our strategies across these two policy uh, domains. Uh, we talk about uh, in, in, in climate, you know, just transition. So we also want to talk about uh, just water partnerships. And, um, you know, what we are really proposing is the reality of the new science of water and the recognition of water as a global common good makes it important to adopt new water strategies, new water management strategies, that advance investments in water resilience and sustainability in low and middle income countries. And, um, you know, this means looking for innovative in solu uh, solutions. It means when you're doing partnerships, it's not just the public sector uh, that comes with innovative ideas. You have to also look at the private sector and what it has to offer. Uh, you have to rethink the way that government approaches the water sector. So I think these just water partnerships will involve local communities, private sector, the public sector coming together to try to, um, to put innovative ways of managing water and partnering, to, partnering together uh, to deliver uh, on, on the issue of the changing the approach uh, uh, to water as a global common good. When it comes to water, what are the main outcomes that the world needs to be focusing on and how do we measure their success um, and in achieving that mission? Sure. So first of all, I believe that it's not a coincidence that we have this massive water problem. I think the framing that we have uh, provided from the economics uh, profession, but especially from the practical side, has continued to see it either just as a sector, so water is a sector, or also with different types of national policies, but also the public policy side of things has ended up just tinkering on the edges. 
So I think one of the biggest changes we need is to confront this as a global problem that requires systemic action. It requires collective action in the sense that we really need a common good framing, which means an mm-hmm. objective to tackle together, as opposed to how public goods are often talked about, where it's just a correction for something that one actor is not doing. A, a, a systemic problem also in the sense that a lot of the research that the uh, commission is actually showing is that you know the it's it's absolutely a collective problem in the sense that deforestation in one part of the world causes flooding in another part of the world causes droughts in another part so the hydrological cycle itself is global and requires that collective action and so you know having systemic collective action requires new types of economics and that's really what we're trying to uh, argue here and then that means that the design of the finance the design of the policy the design of the partnerships needs to change from what we currently have as a status quo. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, yeah, I, I heard in another video you talking about this mission, that it was like when we landed people on the moon, we had this like clear mission. So what would yeah. be the mission statement here? Sort of what is what is that sort of clear mission that we all need to be working towards? Well, first of all, we should remember what a mission approach is. And, you know, going to the moon was not just aerospace. It required uh, changes, investment, innovation in areas as different as health, nutrition, materials, electronics and software. And definitely the water mission, which is to protect the global hydrological cycle and to keep it in safe, you know, constraints. Mm -hmm. Um, That then requires national, local and regional kind of sub missions. Right. You can't kind of dictate to everyone, oh, this is the mission and somehow assume that that's going to inspire action. So really looking at the intersectoral uh, uh, nature of the problem and asking what does it mean for food systems? What does it mean for health systems? What does it mean for how we construct cities? What does it mean for um, how we look at sustainable land use and ecosystems transitions? What does it mean for biodiversity? All these are areas that people are currently working on, but the parts, you know, the uh, the sum of the parts <laughs> is not greater right, right. than you know the whole. So a mission-oriented approach. The idea is that if you actually have a clear mission statement, then what does that mean for how all the different actors work together? You know, so again, on the way to the moon, we ended up with camera phones, foil blankets, uh, baby formula, again, software. These were all solutions to the big mission, but that had a h- kind of a hundred or thousands probably of, of homework problems that had to be solved along the way. So really what those homework problems are that then foster purpose orientation, this is really what we also want the report over the next kind of year to, mm. to highlight. So the idea is that the work we're doing with the commissioners, but also speaking to uh, experts globally will then help us really also formulate what these uh, many, many different homework problems are that have to be solved along the way to the final uh, mission itself, which is, again, keeping the global hydrological cycle in safe boundaries, which it currently is not. But what would you say are sort of the levels of governance that, uh, you know, the most important for for achieving these outcomes? Well, one, uh, because government is so important, is actually to create alignment between different levels of government. And that means local government, regional government, national government, but global governments. You can't have a nationalistic uh, solution to this in the same way that we couldn't have a nationalistic solution to a global health pandemic, right? We ended up with eight different vaccines with COVID-19, but we didn't vaccinate the world. So what does it mean to have a mission like global vaccination? What does it mean for intellectual property rights? What does it mean for the design of public-private partnerships? It's exactly this that we should be asking with this global water crisis. What does it mean for rights, not just intellectual property rights, but all the different rights and ownership structures? What does it mean for how different parts of the world actually work together instead of having water nationalism? Yeah, again, vaccine nationalism, water nationalism. Uh, But also, it's interesting that as a problem, And it's a problem that brings so many different sectors together, but also all the SDGs. I can't think of one sustainable development goal of the 17 that doesn't have a water component. Of course, there's the obvious ones around wash. Uh, There's the obvious one about, you know, life below uh, our oceans. But actually, if you think of gender parity, that's a hugely water relevant uh, area, right? Because many young women, unfortunately, get raped as they go fetch water when they don't have access to it. So really, this is a question also in terms of governance, how it can be an all of government approach. It's not just for the department in a a country that deals with water. It's just as much for the department that deals with health, with equity. Um, If it requires new economic modeling, we need our treasuries, our finance ministries to be paying attention. So it requires an all of government approach.
And also you talk about these submissions, which I guess um, for me is sort of the opportunities that we have to um, to really move the needle and make things yep. um, go forward. And so what are the what would you say are sort of the main opportunities that you see which are going to really move that needle in terms of the water mission? Sure. I mean, we definitely need to scale up current innovations and we shouldn't pretend that we don't have the innovations. They're simply not being scaled up and they're not being, again, approached with that all of government uh, and, and, pu and public private kind of serious collaboration. So the first we need to innovate in and scale solutions for storage uh, systems of water. So we need to address water, water storage holistically. Water uh, storage innovations uh, open up massive opportunities for cross-sectoral collaboration. So across water supply, energy, agriculture, that can actually achieve sustainable development, for example, by preserving natural ecosystems that actually account for the vast bulk of water storage. So wetlands, glaciers, rivers. But also another example would be complementing them with hybrid storage. So urban sponges in China, uh, flood channels, sand dams, and especially also to build the infrastructure that's needed and you know, to finance that building. So of tanks, of, of dams, but dams in the right places, not the wrong places of reservoirs. Second, we need to reduce the extraordinary leakage in water delivery systems today. So there's um, many developed countries where something like 40 percent of water is lost in the course of delivery due to aging infrastructure. Um, we need to scale leakage technology innovation. So for example, thermal uh, imaging drones and satellite technology are increasingly adopted in some countries, but not scaled. Uh, third, we need to innovate in agriculture, which, which is actually the biggest user of water today and a hugely inefficient user. Um, so the technologies actually do exist, things like drip irrigation, precision agriculture, but we can make them affordable. They're currently not affor uh, affordable, so it's not a surprise they're not being used. We need to spread them and help improve farmers' yields at the same time. Uh, precision agriculture is actually an information and technology-driven system leading to transformation and advancements in agriculture, but that means that we actually then need that uh, digital capacity, that IT capacity, that knowledge creation capacity linked with it. So it's not just agro, it's also digital. Fourth, um, and really important, is recycling industrial wastewater. We're currently not recycling the bulk of wastewater, and the runoff is often polluted, uh, and that itself has large economic, social health costs. Uh, indeed, something like 80% of global wastewater is not adequately treated while many regions suffer uh, water scarcity. So you have this kind of irony, right, which shows us it's not actually a total scarcity problem. It's how we're managing, we're mismanaging water. And wastewater reuse can minimize pressure on our freshwater resources. Um, and if we scale the normalized uh, recycled wastewater as the primary resource for agriculture, industry, and even potable use, we could you know, really focus on, on that problem as its own moonshot, coming back to the terms we were using before. Just quickly, um, we also have to, this is fifth type of mission area, to move early to ensure that the transition to a low carbon economy, in particular uh, low emission energies, reduces rather than increases the pressure on water. This is hugely um, an issue right now if we think of the global electrification drive where we need lithium you know, to uh, put into electric cars and yet lithium extraction. Uh, in the countries that um, have it as a natural resource is incredibly uh, uh, water intensive. So this reminds us again that there's a systemic issue. What looks like a solution in one part of the economy is creating a problem in another. And lastly, desalination. And this is an area that's a bit more well known than the others, but it's, it, it can really be a powerful solution for many regions experiencing severe droughts and uh, water shortages. And something I want to talk to you about as well, which I think is part of your work, is, is this uh, the role of the public sector and the role of the private sector. So I think that you talk about the public sector sort of um, shaping shaping the market in a way that sort of um, that, that creates the right incentives. So, what are the incentives that the public sector can uh, can can shape to 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 yeah to create incentives for efficient water use? Yeah, I mean, I believe that just the concept of incentives also is part of the problem. What we need is both direct and indirect policy. So indirect policies are often those incentives. They might be tax incentives, and we can definitely also use tax incentives to uh, to affect change. So, you know, those companies that are actually investing in all those different types of changes I mentioned might be able to get tax reductions, for example. But that means really using tax to kind of tilt the playing field, reward those actions which we know are better uh, for people and planet. So there's something also very important about how people are, you know, at the interface of basically every uh, uh, form of water and what does it mean to, again, bring a human rights approach that holds legal obligations to the private sector 
and the public sector and how they work together around any of those mission areas that I talked about before. I do think that this ultra shareholder value model of corporate governance has not helped us. If we look at the problems being experienced in the UK with Thames Water, for example, this is about corporate governance. And you know, I'm really hoping that the commission will be bold in our recommendations about corporate governance. We need much more stakeholder value, less of an obsession with shareholder value, because we're talking about a good that is absolutely at the center of people's human rights in terms of having clean, affordable, accessible uh, water. And it's going to be very hard to do that if the profit motive is what is kind of directing, uh, you know, solely the profit motive, uh, what's directing companies. And that's, again, why it's important to have these other legal obligations that have to do with stakeholder value and human rights. And I think water is going to be the perfect example of where we can actually sandbox, if, if, if we want to use that word, these different public-private partnerships. I think it'll be important for us in the report to make comparisons with what we've learned in other sectors. If I think about the health sector, which has received huge amounts of public uh, investment just in the United States, $42 billion a year is what the U.S. government spends on health innovation. And somehow it's not embodied in the intellectual property rights. It's not embodying in the prices of the drugs. So, you know, we end up allowing the, the private companies set the prices because we think that's the market model. But the market has uh, has benefited from that public investment. So the market itself is an outcome of how we govern business, of how we govern public, and how we govern their interrelationship. So we should stop talking about like the market. We should say, what kind of market outcomes do we want? And how do you backtrack and actually organize those relationships between business and the public and also civil society uh, uh, actors in order to actually achieve the goal? Right. That's, again, why the mission-oriented uh, approach, I think, is very important. It gets rid of that ideology of public or private, but also gets rid of this confusion, I think, of the market. The market is not business, and how we govern business determines on the kind of market outcomes we get. And I think we've also misgoverned many businesses. I really believe this is the most important piece of work in the sector. That, is, that has taken place in the last, at least, let's say, five years, right? Um, and why is that? Because the whole objective of the Commission on Water was to reset the water narrative, the water action plan, and the, even the water stakeholder group. What was happening is that we were just falling into rabbit holes constantly, or various rabbit holes when it came to water, and there was no real progress on water, no progress on fin financing, no progress on policy or on infrastructure or on, you know, just simply innovation. There are companies like Xylem, which are doing a great job, but not enough. You need much more. So this, um, the idea behind the work of the commission was to recast water as a global issue, not as a tiny little mayor, city level or town level issue, which is one of the rabbit holes that I mentioned, you know. And so to cast it as a global issue and to relook uh, at water as a completely integrated uh, sector um, across an entire hydrological cycle and see what solutions we can come up with. I think number one, we have to look at, as I said, water as an integrated hydrological cycle. Uh, between green and blue water. And this is one of the fundamental uh, pillars of this report. Number two, we have to look at new governance models. This is policy, but importantly, institutions that support the policy. Okay. Number three, again, as I said, we have to look at new innovation models. What does, what, what, yes, there's innovation, but how is it being applied? How is it being integrated to, to actually create a new business model? So innovation is not just on the tech bit, but it's also on the business model side, right? And part of, of that business model is what people keep talking about all the time, which is valuing water or pricing water or coming up with a better sense of what water is worth in today's world, right? Um, the next piece to look at is really new infrastructure models. Water has always been a very capital intensive, very, very centralized infrastructure model. I'm not sure that that's the model of the future, given the way we are growing as a, as a, as a, as a, as a population everywhere, you know? Um, and then finally, once, well, not finally, and then you have to look at the, what I call the social inclusion model, if you will, because so far it's the only social piece to water was it's a fundamental human right. 
Yeah, fine. Of course it is. What are we doing about it? How are we putting a social inclusion part as an integral part of the motto model in any country or in any city or in any, you know, we're just not doing enough of that. We have to. And finally, if we do all those things successfully, we have to come up and they will come up because it's just going to happen. We have to come up with new financing models and financing, not necessarily instruments, because people keep talking about instruments. It's really models, you know, uh, the give and take in a finance deal um, and how that applies uh, to the water sector. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that's actually one of my next questions is sort of, you know, if we change this framework, where does the money need to come from and where does it need to go? Because I think that's the ultimate question. Mm -hmm. I, the money will come from wherever it sits. There's plenty of money out there. There's no, there's no lack or dearth of liquidity. This is the thing to keep in mind. There is a lack of financing and business models and a lack of true partnership between the between the traditional and non-traditional actors in the water sector. And I'm hesitating saying public private because that's what we always say. I'm saying traditional and non-traditional. Lack of understanding to see how to finance this thing. See, because if you talk to a finance person like myself, and if I, if I wasn't a water person, I'd say, there's no way I'm going to fund it, right? I'll never get my money back. And if I get my money back, it's going to be at, a, at, a, at an unacceptable rate of return. Maybe, right? Maybe that, that may be true, but it's probably not true. In nine out of 10 cases, it's not true. We just have to work on it. We have to think together uh, on, on that. So the money's there. The partnerships have to be developed properly. The type of financing has to be developed properly. And in my thinking, right, as a final point to your question, I believe blended finance 2.0 will consist of three pieces compared to blended finance 1.0, which was just policy and finance together. 2.0 has to have policy, of course, has to have finance, but it also has to have social inclusion. So if you think of a structure, it has to have a policy piece, obviously a finance piece, but then a social instrument of some sort in order to ensure this social equity um, issue that has dogged this sector forever and continues to unreasonably, in my view, as a water person. I, I think it's just something we shouldn't get stuck on. And we are. Mm -hmm, right. And is that something that, so the report talks about just water partnerships. Is that what these partnerships are supposed to, to, to That's to exactly enable? right. Water justice is not some loose, weird, uh, you know, concept. It's a concept that, um, that, invites action, that invites structuring, that invites models and so on and so forth. So it's very, yes, the report pays a lot of attention to water justice, I mean, you know, as, as a concept. Yeah, there is no trade-off because trade-offs mean zero-sum games and zero-sum games mean there's a winner and there's a loser. So what we're saying in the report is that you have to have both. You have to have the efficiency piece, whatever that means, and that typically means the technology, the infrastructure model, the policy framework around it. That's, that all creates the efficiency. But you also need the equity piece because I'll tell you, Talula, going forward in, in tomorrow's world without social equity or, or social inclusion up there with financial return and economic return and policy return, we're not gonna make it. That's why we're saying there's no trade-off and, and Gozi is absolutely right. I am optimistic. I'm optimistic because this report is putting down a pathway that has not been looked at before. So in and, and it's a and it's a very sort of comprehensive pathway. It's an it's an integrated pathway that brings those various strands of required action together, as I said, finance, innovation, governance, social, all those. So that's why the optimism, I really believe it's, it's going to be a substantial step forward. Now, the caution comes from simply that we need to bring together the required partners and stakeholders in moving forward. That is always, <laughs> that's always uh, more difficult than, 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 than what we think it will be, right? Um, and there's all sorts of partners that have to come together, including legacy actors, as I call them, who may be disadvantaged, at least initially, from a new look at water. 
And I think we need to bring everybody around a given table in order to move forward. So I'm optimistic, more than cautiously optimistic, but less than wildly optimistic. Right. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, yeah, I think that what you were just saying at the end there kind of leads on to my final question is that, so first of all, who are those, you know, who are the people, the stakeholders that you really want to hear this message? Um, and what, if you had, you know, 30 seconds to say the most important thing to them, what, what would it be? The number, the, the, not number one, the most important set of stakeholders who need to hear the message, in my view, are the politicians slash policymakers. In my view, the private sector, even civil society and others have been um, more willing than not to participate. But everybody always says, we're lacking the political willingness. We're lacking the regulatory and policy frameworks in order for us to work efficiently and in a um, you know productive way in this sector. So the message from the report in mind, I'm not saying this only because I'm coming out of the United Nations, but they, that's the first group that should embrace the messages of the report.